Welcome to Channel 17, the Town of Colony Government Channel. Hello, I'm Colony Town Judge Peter Crummy, and welcome to Benchmark. We'll explore a variety of issues involving our justice system and our legal system, and how those issues intersect with the citizens of the town of Colony. Today, we are truly fortunate to have a very exciting attorney who serves as our Albany County Public Defender. Please welcome Peter Tornsello. Peter, how are you? Judge, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's a great topic. I'm excited to spend a couple hour, or half hour with you. And uh, Well, that's more than most people would like I to know. do. Yeah, so. yeah exactly. <laughs> well, I'm one of you. Count me as one of them, okay? I'm happy to be here and uh, ex excited about it. Well, we're so excited. And of course, your background as an attorney uh, is so exciting. And even uh, your background, even before you went to law school, is so exciting. And I know the citizens would like to know a little bit about you and how you became public defender here in Albany County. Sure, I'd love to. Uh, well, I'm a local boy. I went to, uh, I grew up in Waterville Elite. I went to public schools, Waterville Elite High School. I actually went to Maplewood Grammar School, uh, which I know is now going to be part of the North Colony School System, and I'm excited about that as a graduate of Maplewood. Um, after Waterville High School, I went to the University of Rhode Island, actually on a basketball scholarship, and played basketball URI in Kingston. at URI in Kingston, right. and uh, lived on the beach for a little while. Uh, ultimately, though, I graduated from Union College, uh, and after Union College, um, moved down to Washington, D.C., and I lived and worked in Washington, D.C. on the staff of Congressman Sam Stratton, which was a tremendous experience. I was a legislative aide uh, for Mr. Stratton uh, his last three years in office uh, and sort of looked around Washington and, uh, and noticed that uh, there were a lot of lawyers. And uh, all the people that were sort of uh, you know, above me and the people that uh, I looked at and, and sort of admired were lawyers. So uh, I uh, did what I thought I should do. I, uh, Packed up, moved back home into my old bedroom in Waterville, uh, attended Albany Law School, and uh, graduated from Albany Law School in about 1991, and was hired by then Albany County District Attorney Sal Greenberg, uh, who was another tremendous, uh, tremendous man with a tremendous That's history. True. So I was I was very fortunate to work with those with those two gentlemen. Uh, spent about 13 years in the Albany County uh, District Attorney's Office. Uh, ultimately, uh, my job was as the bureau chief for the sex offense unit in the district attorney's office, which uh, my responsi responsibilities basically were to handle all cases involving sex offenses, all cases involving domestic violence, and all crimes against children. Uh, it was very rewarding. Uh, I enjoyed my time in the DA's office, but as with a lot of things, it comes time to move on. Uh, and I moved on and uh, started a private firm and worked in the, in the criminal defense uh, world. I also worked as a, an assistant conflict defender in the Albany County Conflict Defender's Office. Um, in 19, excuse me, 2006, uh, there was a vacancy in the Albany County Public Defender's Office. Uh, that was Eugene Devine was the, was the public defender. Eugene Devine became Supreme Court Judge Devine. And he's joined us in this show previously. Oh, it's wonderful. Yep. i got big shoes to fill in. Uh, Gus Devine and uh, Judge Devine is a, is a wonderful man. He ran a wonderful office in the Public Defender's Office. Uh, he's now moved on. He's a Supreme Court judge. Uh, and I was tapped by uh, uh, Michael Breslin, the county executive, uh, and approved by the Albany County Legislature. I know you were previously a, a member of that legislature. Eight years. So you know that process. Very special time. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, was approved by the legislature. And uh, for now, for a little more than a year, almost a year and a half now, I've been the public defender in Albany County. I'm very happy to serve in that capacity. Well, Peter, uh, there's no question that your background is, is very exciting. And to have uh, work with icons <clears throat> like yeah. uh, Sam Stratton and, uh, and um, our friend Saul Greenberg as right. well, uh, certainly uh, provide uh, some excellent uh, insight into uh, society and the workings of law yeah. because it really does involve people. Sure, it and, does. And uh, your uh, practice now as the, our Albany County Public Defender 
uh, in my opinion, uh, certainly makes you one of the largest law firms in the, uh, in the, certainly in Albany County anyway, by just looking at the volume of cases that your office handles in my own courthouse. And uh, globally, how many cases does the Albany County Public Defender handle on an annual basis? Well, on a, annually, our office handles uh, approximately 12,000 cases. Now, that is criminal cases as well as cases in Albany County Family Court. Uh, that's a massive number. We have approximately 34 lawyers currently. Uh, we have a staff of about 50 or 50, 55 wow. or so. Uh, it is one of the largest law offices uh, in, the, in the county. Uh, I am very proud of my lawyers. I am very proud of my staff. They are very hardworking, uh, but there's a lot of work to do. Uh, and uh, it, it's, uh, it's challenging. It's very challenging. Well, you know, Peter, a lot of people uh, over time uh, have a comment uh, that uh, they don't under understand really the, the, the nature of why people can get an attorney and how come they paid for an attorney and somebody else uh, is assigned by the court an attorney mm -hmm. and uh, the history of the public defense. Could you comment on that for us? I sure can. Uh, uh, the history of public defense really dates back to, I think, about 1962 in a famous case called Gideon versus Wainwright uh, that involved a, a young man, Mr. Wayne, Mr. Gideon, excuse me, uh, who was accused of a larceny. And uh, the extent of the larceny was, I think, a bottle of whiskey and some change from a cash register at a local tavern that, that he was at. Uh, when he went to court, uh, uh, after he was, he was ultimately he was arrested and when he went to court, he asked the judge to have a lawyer appointed for him, that he was indigent. He could not afford his own, his own attorney. Uh, that request was denied. There was a trial where Mr. Gideon represented himself and surprising, not surprisingly, Mr. Gideon was convicted. He was sentenced to five years incarceration by the judge. During that five-year period, Mr. Gideon hand wrote a letter to the United States Supreme Court. And that handwritten letter uh, actually made its way to the United States Supreme Court and it was, a, it was a request. And the request in essence said it wasn't a fair fight. Uh, the district attorney's office and, and the police, they had these lawyers who were trained, they knew the law, they had read the books, they knew the procedure. I'm just a poor, humble man. I don't have any money. I don't have any real knowledge of the law. It wasn't a fair fight. I think the court should have appointed a lawyer to me. Uh, and ultimately, uh, uh, as, as it were, the United States Supreme Court agreed with Mr. Gideon. And at that time, in the early 60s, that is when a mandate went, uh, went out across the nation that uh, in cases involving criminal cases uh, where individuals are indigent, they cannot afford a lawyer, uh, that a lawyer will be appointed for them. And it seems so natural now. You know, we're in 2008, and it seems very natural, but there is a history, and there was a growth to it. And, it, and, it, and the law, as, as you know, uh, it, it's not stagnant. It moves and it grows, and that is sort of the genesis of the public defender's office. Um, and that's, that's the beginning, and that's what takes us to, uh, to where we are today, handling 12,000 cases in the county. In, in your time uh, as an, a practicing attorney over the past 16 years, mm -hmm. have you noticed uh, yourself that the, a growth of cases handled by your office? Uh, I see a, a, a tremendous uh, uh, growth. Uh, uh, as time goes by, uh, uh, there are, there are uh, courts, appellate divisions, there are su uh, Supreme Courts and Courts of Appeals that, that sort of uh, chip away or that they dictate the, that more and more cases have to be handled by, uh, by the Public Defender's Office. Originally, before Gideon, the only time you were permitted to, uh, to have an assigned counsel was in a capital case, in a murder case. Well, and then Gideon came along and they said any criminal case. And it gets sort of ex expansive and it keeps growing and growing. Uh, there are a lot, a lot more cases now that are being handled by my office. And uh, the economy has a lot to do with it. Uh, you know, we're living in, in tough times now, and perhaps uh, two years ago or five years ago, there are people who were employed, who, uh, um, who you know, had a, had a job, uh, could afford an apartment and, and, and whatever, and could afford an attorney. We're seeing people, uh, more people in that regard as well, you know, I think. Well. Um, of course, there are so many uh, local courts uh, and, of course, the Albany County Court mm -hmm. that you have to service. Um, and uh, I think there's as many as 17 
uh, local uh, courts in the county that you are responsible to provide uh, counsel as a public defender. Is that correct? That is correct. And you know, there are there are uh, there is Albany County Court, which is the main uh, uh, co uh, county court in in, uh, in Albany for felony. Uh, hearings, felony trials, and any indicted cases. That's, uh, that's in the county. That is currently housed by, there are th two judges and, and, and an acting uh, county court, Supreme Court judge, uh, who, handle that, who handle that caseload. In addition to that, there are town, village, city courts, much like Colony. Now, they aren't all like Colony. Colony is, uh, as, I, uh, as I recall, is probably one of the largest town courts in the state. That's correct. Uh, it is one of the largest town or city courts in the state. Is that correct? I, I believe, I don't, I don't have the numbers, you may. Well, at the end of uh, 2007, uh, according to the Office of Court Administration, Colony right. Town Court was the 29th busiest court of all courts in the state of New York, and that includes county, state, and uh, local courts. It's That's the volume alone of 25,000 cases a year. Uh, puts it at that number, which I think um, certainly uh, uh, is probably the most significant number yeah. that I've heard uh, over yeah. time. I mean, that, does that Otherwise. include New York and Manhattan, its boroughs yes, and all it that? Yes, it does, and Long Island as well. I mean, that is a tremendous number, and that, that should give, you know, the listeners some idea of the activity that goes on in the town of Colony and, and you know, how busy that court is. Now, but in, in addition to those courts, like, like, you know, like the town of Colony, there are the smaller courts. And, you know, we send our attorneys to Rensselaerville. We send our attorneys to Voorheesville and Altamont. And there, is a, there are caseloads in Green Island and some of the smaller, you know, some of the smaller uh, uh, towns and villages out there. Um, one of the things that I try to do with our attorneys, and when we have our little staff meetings and we have our little pep talks, um, we have some very experienced attorneys on our, on our staff. And they know, I, I believe, uh, how to handle cases uh, efficiently uh, and expeditiously. Okay, and they can look at a case, and they may look at a case, and in a minute or two, they can determine where the strong points of a case are, where the weak points of the defense are, and the most appropriate way to defend a case. Um, and that's, they can zip along. The, they can zip along. That's seasoned uh, practice through these through these cases. Uh, part of the thing that I like to talk to to, to the attorneys about is that. Uh, while you, while the lawyer have, may have seen dozens and dozens and dozens of these same cases, that person, that client in front of you, that's their first time in many instances. And, in, and it's the most important case and it's the most important thing in their life at that day. And you know, you may be a lawyer who has handled a thousand uh, pettit larcenies, you know? Uh, and you can look at it and say, okay, this is, this is gonna be just like the other thousand or, or determine whether it is or not. But you know what? That charge for that person is the most important thing in their life on that day and in that moment. And their life really is revolving around their, their visit today uh, in, in court. And we try to, uh, we try to drill that into the, the lawyers. I think we're, we're successful in that. I'm very proud of our lawyers. Uh, and I think, uh, I think we're really moving in the right direction in that regard. And it's not unlike the court itself that must look at each case, by case on a case-by-case -case basis. Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, and uh, the volume uh, that, uh, that you represent uh, yeah. uh, continues to grow in that way right. and uh, will um, right. uh, continue to require uh, you to uh, uh, come to the county uh, and, and, and seek uh, the resources and the capacity to continue to evolve the office in order to respond to the public's need. When I was in the county legislature, uh, the discussion began about uh, converting or moving uh, our district attorney's office and the public defender's office toward a more full-time uh, operation. And, uh, and I bet that continues today. How are you uh, evolving your office today? It does. Let me, let me say that the, the history of the Albany County Public Defender's Office has have been a mix of full-time and uh, part-time at attorneys. I have to be careful by using the phrase part-time, okay, because each attorney in our office devotes 35 hours a week or more, in most cases many, many more hours, to the, to the office. Uh, however, there are full-time people who come into the office, they, they, they swipe in and swipe out, they start at 8.30 and they work till 4.30, uh, they go and they do their night courts. There, there is another portion of that office who has traditionally been allowed to maintain an outside practice, uh, private practice, mostly a lot, some civil work and things on the side, to supplement their income. Um, 
when I was uh, approached by Mr. Breslin uh, and we talked about my job as the, uh, as the public defender, one of the things, that was one of the hot points that we talked about. And it was his feeling, and I happen to agree with him, that it, is more, it would be more efficient okay, to have a, an, an office of entirely full-time staff that comes into your office just like a regular office and stays there from 8.30 to 4.30 and then goes to the night courts and do whatever. We are making strides toward that. Uh, I've come up with a, with a, with a plan. I've uh, made that proposal to Mr. Breslin. Uh, he has approved it. I've made it to the county legislature and they are on board and they, they are approved it. So the direction of the Albany County Public Defender's Office is, is going that way. We are going to uh, slowly uh, move in the direction where every single lawyer in that office will be uh, paid as a full-time lawyer, uh, will come in in the morning, will leave in the afternoon, and will really, really work in that building uh, from 9 to 5. And that will certainly take a commitment uh, by the uh, county officials. I know that historically the notion uh, was often uh, set forth that, well, it's important to have some part-time senior attorneys because they bring such a, a, a su such breadth to a, a particular case and if we don't have those affiliated with our office whether it be the DA's office or the public defender's office we may only have younger attorneys with less seasoning and it would be harder for them uh, to um, uh, um, practice to the same level that uh, a, uh, a senior attorney um, has how do you how do you compensate for that well, as you move forward? First of all, I think that's a tremendous point, Judge. All right, and I and I think that uh, that's something that a lot of people um, who are outside of the legal system don't recognize. Okay, and my my answer to that is that um, if we had, it would be wrong to sort of have a magic wand, even if we had the money, and say everybody is going to be uh, you know full time and be in that office all day long. Now you would lose the senior experienced people. Uh, that is why the plan that we've put together provides for doing it over a long period of time. It's a five-year five plan that we have. And over that five-year period of time, we think that we will build that pipeline of younger lawyers and that the younger lawyers that start to get out of law school will be mentored and trained by those more senior lawyers. The, uh, you know, I don't want to name drop, but the, the Peter Lynch's, the Joe McCoy's, uh, Jim Milstein's, uh, Michael Feitz, I'm, 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 I know I'm, you know I'm forgetting, I'm picking them, but I'm forgetting a lot of other tremendous lawyers. But uh, over a period of time, if we can build a pipeline and have those senior attorneys mentor the younger attorneys, when it is time for them to retire, to, to, you know, to move on and, and leave the Albany Public Defender's Office, that there will be a nice flow of younger and then more senior and then ultimately very experienced lawyers at the end of that uh, pipeline to fill their shoes. Uh, you can't do it in one day. It's, it, it takes time. Uh, there was a lot of thought put into the plan. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's going in the right direction and I think it's going to be very successful for our office. I, I applaud Mr. Breslin um, for really having some frank discussions. And these are exactly the issues that I talked about uh, with him right. uh, you know, when I was hired. These are also the exact questions that I hear from the county legislature sure. when I go before the legislature. Uh, and they understand there's, there's a number of lawyers on the legislature. They ask the exact same question that you did. And they really do. They have a good, very good working knowledge of what goes on in the public defender's office uh, and what goes on in the district attorney's office as well. Well, I'm sure that it will continue to evolve, uh, evolve successfully under your leadership. I hope so. You've had some great experience, not only as prosecutor, mm -hmm. as public defender, and in private practice. Any comments in general, general you'd like to share with us about the difference in um, those positions? Well, uh, you know, I, I, I really enjoy public service. And uh, I seem to made a career out of, uh, you know, out of, out of public service. Uh, I, I like to believe that when I was in the DA's office, my job really was to help people. Uh, and I, I, I took great pride and I took great satisfaction out of helping uh, victims of crimes. And I, I worked hard and, uh, you know, I was in a, a, a tough uh, bureau. And I, uh, you know, I dealt with a lot of uh, children who were injured or, uh, or women who were abused or uh, children who were sexually, sexually abused. And I can remember people coming to me often and saying, how do you do that? How, how can you do that? That must be difficult. And I would always spin it, and which is, as I felt, the truth is that uh, that's the most rewarding 
uh, part of your job. Right. You know, help, helping people, uh, helping women, helping children, those are, that's the rewarding part of your job. Well, sort of when I, when I went 180 degrees and I started working in, in, in the defense area, uh, it really is the same work. Uh, you know, your goal is the same thing. My goal is in the DA's office was treat people fairly, get to the get to the truth, treat and you know treat people fairly and help them. It really is the same goal in the public defender's office. I have uh, you know clients now. We had twelve thousand clients. Uh, I had clients in private practice. Your goal is the same. You want the level. You want the playing field to be level. You want to help your client as best as uh, you know as best you can, uh, and you want to you want to work you know work towards that same goal of uh, of you're a public servant and you serve the public and uh, it's 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 enjoyable. You know, Peter, you brought up the um, the domestic violence uh, piece of your uh, prosecution work, and it seems to me over my nine years uh, serving the citizens of the town as a town justice that um, that seems to be a growing segment of my own caseload. And, uh, uh, and oftentimes in the middle of the night as well, that uh, routinely, even this morning, right. I was out at 3 a.m. on a matter. People yeah. don't know that about judges, do they? Yeah. Well, I mean, not they about the town judges, probably. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> they don't know that about the town judges, right. that at, very, you know, at 3 o'clock in the morning and 4 o'clock in the morning, uh, if there is an individual who needs, to, uh, who needs attention in court, needs to be arraigned, there needs to be a judge there. Yeah, and, and that's uh, true, and we yeah. are routinely uh, uh, called out in that way, and that, uh, that is part of the, uh, uh, the position that we have right. uh, at this particular point, uh, short mm -hmm. of having some type of a facility or holding cell, like, for instance, maybe Albany City enjoys. Correct. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, um, I'm out at all hours, and uh, many times it involves uh, a domestic case mm -hmm. um, in that way and uh, requiring, say, orders of protection uh, and it continues to grow. Do you think that, do you agree with me that there is growth, sadly, in this area? Sa yes, I do. Is it because we're just finding out about it more, or actually the incidents are on the increase, or is it just coming out of the closet, or, well, or a little of both? Well, I think, I think it's probably that, that, that mix of both. I do think that there has been more awareness brought to the issue, which is a great thing. Yes, it is. Okay? And I think that the, uh, the more awareness and the more publicity that particular issue, issue gets, uh, it's, it's a good thing, and that leads to what we see in our jobs. We see uh, a bigger caseload of domestic violence, uh, of domestic violence cases. Uh, I do know that in Albany City Court, there is a particular domestic violence court, and that is housed by one judge, Judge Carter, in Albany City Court, and uh, once, actually twice a week, every Tuesday, he conferences cases with assistant public defenders and, um, and private defense attorneys. Uh, and on Wednesdays, the defendants go before Judge Carter, and they are particularly assigned um, domestic violence cases only. Um, so uh, in, in that regard, yeah, I, I can see that, that, growing, that, that, that growing number. Uh, I would hope that the, the problem is not getting better, that there, were mo that there was more violence today, um, but I, I, I can't be sure of that. I can't be sure of that. Well, you know, one thing that I do see a lot of as well is uh, theft crimes. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously, uh, Colony being the downtown of the capital region, as Frank right. Field used to tell me That's right. uh, when I worked for him as a young town attorney. Uh, I see it in the courtroom all the time because we have more retail space than That's any correct. other municipality in the capital region. And as a result, sometimes it does bring people to our uh, retail centers uh, and not always with the best intentions mm -hmm. as a result and it does have an impact on my caseload as well seems to me that addictions are often related uh, to some of the theft crimes that I have in fact at, at um, uh, a significant amount do you see that in on your end as well that addictions are often tied into the the crime for which has been alleged against a, a, a person. Absolutely, uh, and part of the part of the reason that uh, uh, part of the job of an assistant public defender really is to is to try to identify if there is an addiction either to alcohol or to drugs um, or other any other psychological problems, and to seek assistance uh, for that for that client. We work very closely with organizations, with honor court organizations, with TASC. Uh, I know you're familiar with these, sure. with, with, with these organizations. We work very closely with them uh, to try to get people help 
Uh, in addition, I mean, there, there in many cases, there's, there's a, uh, a, a, a punishment involved in their crime. But the ultimate goal here for everyone is to rehabilitate. And if people need help, uh, with a substance uh, abuse problem, if people need uh, help with a psychological problem, um, that's part of our job, and we have to try to identify that. There are a number of agencies and a number of groups in Colony Town Court that we rely heavily on uh, to help our to help our clients. Hell, I mean, our lawyers could not do the job, frankly, uh, without the help of these outside agencies. We 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 just couldn't do it, and and you need that you need them. We rely on their expertise. Um, you know, we're, we're lawyers. I am not an, uh, uh, an expert on addiction. I am not a lawyer. I am not an expert on alcohol. Uh, but there are people. And I think we'd be foolish. Uh, and, uh, and the court would, it wouldn't be wise of the court either to not really rely on the people who are experts in that field to, to, to help us and to help us understand some of the problems. I, I, have, always, I have always felt, uh, and I don't know what, I'd like to hear, you know, your opinion on this, but I, I would say that 90% is a is probably too high number, but the amount of crimes that involve alcohol or drugs is astronomical. Now, whether it's a larceny because someone needs money to buy drugs, or whether it's a, um, uh, a, a domestic violence case because somebody has had too much alcohol, or whether it's a, uh, obviously the DWIs and things like that. I mean, there is a, there is a, a, a kernel or a grain of alcohol or drug abuse in almost every case all across the uh, all across the board I find well I don't disagree with you in viewing the uh, mm -hmm. a caseload uh, and I'll do 8,000 cases a year over the last nine years and I don't disagree with you in fact when I'm uh, at the high schools and colleges speaking to them I'll tell them uh, just about the uh, same thing that you've just said because it seems to be uh, so much uh, intertwined yeah. and, uh, and and bringing everybody into the justice court system whether it's a harassment violation Correct. or whether it is some type of a, a violent crime uh, oftentimes it involves some type of uh, drug abuse and alcohol being I think the number one abused drug as I see it in the courthouse yeah. uh, I'm seeing uh, crack cocaine which is uh, the the next um, uh, a large issue that it that uh, generates and drives criminal activity right. uh, very powerful uh, right. uh, addiction uh, but and it, um, it can it's it's strangling so much of our right. justice system as well right. but again judge you don't see it just in the drug crime it's not just the possession of crack cocaine right. or the use of crack cocaine it is I need crack cocaine so I'm going to go to uh, Colony Center right. and I'm going to shoplift okay and uh, you see it all, all the way through the, you know, the, in, the, entire, the entire system. Or I'm going to sneak into a window of somebody's home and steal jewelry because I need to feed my habit. And you're right also in the, in the I don't want to say that the lesser crimes, but the harassments and, uh, and the disorderly conducts and things like that. It's as a result of poor judgment right. or no judgment and many times uh, brought about by abusive substances. And, uh, Peter, you've been involved in so many trials as well, uh, not only as a prosecutor, as a public defender, even in private practice. Mm -hmm. are, there, are, are there any particular cases that you'd like, now that they're closed, and uh, uh, whether you'd like to comment on some of the, um, the fact pattern or some type of lesson that was learned or some type of impact that it had on our county or a, a particular neighborhood or family? Well, I'll tell you, one of the, uh, in my estimation, the, the, the most important case uh, that, I, that I ever tried uh, its genesis was in, in the town of Colony. Uh, and I worked with the police department in the town of Colony. I worked with Chief Heider, uh, and I worked with the detectives in the town of Colony. Uh, there was a, uh, a, a pediatric neurosurgeon uh, named Philip Rybeck, who um, uh, was accused originally of uh, having improper sexual contact with uh, a couple of his young patients. and. Uh, through the tremendous work of the colony police, and I, and I really mean that. I mean, there was one little allegation, and they dug and dug and dug and followed up and used their tremendous resources to, to mount, really, an impressive investigation. Uh, ultimately, it turned out that there was a, uh, uh, an indictment that alleged, alleged sex crimes uh, against, I believe, 12 or 14 young, uh, uh, young boys. Um, there was a conviction in that case. Um, and that's an, that's an important case. Uh, you talk about 
uh, that, those, those are the types of things where, the, where the, the, the parents would come to me and they would say, how can you do that? How do you, how do you deal with um, you know, 10-year-old boys and 12-year-old boys and, and, and the abuse that they, you know, that they get? Well, there was, there was such a feeling of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of, of joy in that you helped people. Uh, at the conclusion of that trial, and you made friends, and you 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 helped the family, uh, perhaps not heal totally, but you you took a step toward that you know toward that way. You you closed one chapter of their life now that that they can that they can move on. And those were wonderful families that I dealt with. I mean, and I and I know that uh, you know the detectives in the town of Colony, um, Detective Kenny Fuchs uh, at the at, uh, at the time. I worked closely with him. I I, I can't imagine the hours that he put in working on this case to help, you know, a dozen different families who, have, who had been harmed. Uh, that's one of them. That is, a, uh, uh, that is an exciting case. That's a case that happened right here in, uh, in Colony. Uh, I, was, I was proud to be a resident of Colony. I am a resident of Colony, yes, if, you you didn't, uh, if you didn't know that. Uh, I am a resident of Colony. Uh, my, uh, my, my, my girls go to Shaker High. They go to Shaker Junior High, or they go to public schools. I'm very happy. And I was really proud of, uh, of, of being in that city, and I was proud of the police force, uh, you know, the work of Chief Hyder. And uh, I, 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 that was a great, that was a, uh, a great outcome. Uh, and that was one, one sort of significant case. Um, there are others. Sure. There are others that are a little more violent. Well, uh, and, uh, you know, someday we can talk about those. Well, you mentioned your dynamic family. And uh -oh. I know that uh, you have, uh, uh, you have a, a daughter who's fantastic in soccer <laughs> and, uh, and will continue to shine on behalf of our North Colony school system. Hey, I'm I, sure. hey I love, uh, uh, you know, I was an athlete. My wife is actually the best athlete in the family. My wife was a runner all through college. Uh, she is a uh, still an avid runner. You'll probably see her running down Route Nine every once in a while. You know, every once in a while, uh, we are we're a sports family. Uh, uh, not that the books aren't more important, uh, but uh, real very very happy with uh, with North Colony Schools. Uh, real happy at Shaker Junior High. We're about to embark on uh, on Shaker High School. Uh, as I said, uh, how about this? I went to Maplewood Grammar School, which is going to be a uh, uh, you know part of the North Colony District. My children originally went to Maplewood School, uh, and my mother went to Maplewood School uh, as one of the first graduates of that uh, of that area. And so now you brought Maplewood to North now Colony we Central it. School System. There you go. It's come it's come full circle. Well, it's, we're it's lucky to have circle. the uh, Tornsello family here in the town of Colony. I'm happy to be here, and we're thrilled uh, that you were able to join us today, Peter. Thank Thank you very much. It's uh, fantastic, and thank you for having me. I'm Judge Peter Crummy, and thank you for joining me on Benchmark. <laughs>